We are in the first week of a brand new teaching series called Temptations. And this is a two-week series, and it's really an important message set. I think it's gonna be helpful. And uh, for week one, I wanna talk about resisting temptation. And then week two, I wanna talk about overcoming temptation failure. And uh, both weeks are gonna be really helpful, practical. I would encourage you to come to both. They're gonna be intertwined. And uh, even if you're not a Christian, I think you're gonna like this. Temptation, though, is kind of a unique thing for Christians. And I know that that might be a surprise for me to say, well, temptation is something only Christians face. But um, what I'm about to say is just a personal anecdote. But as I was preparing for this uh, message set, I went on to Audible to look for books on temptation. And specifically, I was searching for secular books on temptation because I like to read some books. And let's be honest, occasionally a book before a teaching series. You know, I do the best I can, but I can't read good. And uh, I'm kidding, I can read fine. But I was looking for a book on temptation that was secular and I found none. There were no secular books on temptations, okay? There was a litany of like mommy romance novels on temptation. I was like, yikes, I didn't know. Man, I'm not old enough to even look at this stuff. This is crazy. But um, I was surprised not to find a single secular book on overcoming temptation. The closest thing I could find in my Audible search were books on self-discipline, which was really interesting. Now, there were dozens of Christian books on dealing with temptation because temptation is a uniquely Christian thing. The closest secular analog would be um, self-discipline, but temptation itself is a unique part of Christian theology and Christian culture that is generally interesting but not understood by Christians and non-Christians alike. So even if you're not a Christian, I think you're gonna find this message helpful, interesting, and transformative. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna lay down a story to make a core analogy. And then we're gonna look at the Bible to see how to overcome temptation. And that's the whole message, it's pretty simple. Now let's start with a story. Before I tell the story, I want you guys to know, and this is kind of critical, um, Kristen gave me permission to tell the story, okay? She does look a wee bit irrational and bad in this story. And some of you guys are like, is he going to get killed when he comes home after telling this story? I technically have permission. I do have a little bit of concern that despite the permission, I don't know if you've ever done this. She says it's fine, but then it's not fine. This could be one of those situations we will find out when I get home, but I have permission. For years, I have been casually flipping jet skis. I think it's a lot of fun to pick up a junky jet ski. I got my first one years ago. I watched it in my neighbor's yard, just rotting, no cover for a couple years. You know, summer never went, never moved. And it had a big cookie monster bite out of the front of it. I think someone rammed a dock with it at some point. And I looked at that and in my mind, that's perfect because it was obviously powered when it hit the dock. That means the motor probably still runs in it as long as it didn't get hydrolocked. So I went and I knocked on the door. I thought, man, this is no, nothing a little duct tape can't fix. And I knocked on the door and I said, hey, do you want to sell that jet ski? He he said, hey, it's got a big cookie monster bite out of the front of it. I said, hey, that's not a problem, duct tape. He's like, all right, 300 bucks. I said, great, $300 later, I had a jet ski on a trailer, which is fantastic, this is it. 93 Yamaha VXR, there's my tape. Some of it had fallen off at that point, who cares? Just put it on the lift and drain it. But anyway, I've been buying, using, and selling jet skis since then. Post Labor Day, my friends, post Labor Day is the time. Right now, Facebook Marketplace, prime time. You wanna find a $200, $300 jet ski that runs, kind of, this is the time. A few years ago, I'd been flipping up for a while and I flipped up into a Yamaha FX 140. This was my first four stroke jet ski and uh, it had fallen off a lift in a storm. It was an insurance salvage and uh, it ran fine. It just had a ton of cosmetic marks, which for me is no big deal. That's, you know, a nothing burger. It's like, wow, it still runs. This is great. A two stroke jet ski, they weigh about 400 pounds. Not bad. And you bring them into the dock, you kind of land them and you catch them. You push off against the dock. They don't have reverse. Most of them don't. This jet ski, four-stroker, weighed 1,200 pounds with people and oil. You know, a lot heavier, more than half a ton, sometimes 1,300, depending on who's on it. But anyway, when you land a two-stroke jet ski, no big deal. Four-stroke jet ski, you got to do it differently. And my wife thought you could just do it the same. And I told her, I said, babe, the four-stroke jet ski has this thing called reverse, you know? And I don't know if you've ever thought about reverse, but it's important. And can you please use reverse? And she looked at me and she was like, John, why do you have to be so controlling about everything? You know, you have to make it so stressful. Can you just let me do it my way? So she would cruise into the dock with more than half a ton of weight. And I would try and catch it. First time I catch it and she drags me across the front of the dock, literally several feet, just drug across, you know, as I'm trying to stop this thing. I mean, if I got my leg pinched poorly, it would break my leg, you know? And I stop it and she said, see, that worked fine. And I was like, mm, that's a variable definition of fine. I don't think that was fine. I begged her, I said, babe, please, we just, we try reverse. 
And she said, why do you have to make things so stressful? You do this with cars. You do this with boats. Can't I just, can I just enjoy this thing? I feel, and this is her line, I feel unseen, unloved, and unheard. And that is Kristen saying, here's the line, don't cross it or you die. Unseen, unloved, and unheard. And I said, I feel unsafe when you land. You know what I mean? <laughs> but nevertheless, so for a whole summer and a half, like 50 to 100 landings, she would just send it into the dock, right? And I was like, man, this stinks, you know? And fortunately, like I mentioned, it was an insurance salvage because, I mean, she smashed that thing into the dock to the point where the front two by four in the dock actually got loose. I had to screw it in again. You know, parts of my body, parts of the jet ski. I have splinter scars in my booty. I won't show you, but they're there. What it came down to, what it came down to, this is big, is my plan versus her plan. My plan, she had a plan, and I had a plan, a rational plan. Her plan, irrational, okay? But we had two different plans, two different plans. And that to me is what temptation is. Temptation is when your plan and God's plan differ. That's temptation. And what happens, temptation is to, the temptation is to stick with your personal fleshly plan rather than having faith to trust that God's plan is best and follow that plan. It's not really a sin to have a different plan than God. That's kind of human nature. It's part of our flesh. What turns temptation into sin is when we choose God's plan over our plan. I wonder if anyone here has been facing temptation recently where your plan and God's plan differ. Perhaps you want a divorce when God calls you to forgive. Perhaps you want to gossip because they deserve to have their hypocrisy made known, but God calls you to trust him and let him be your vindicator. Maybe you want to have easy sex or an easy relationship now when God calls you to wait for the best sex in the context of marriage. You know, Kristen and I don't fight all the time. We do, we do fight for our marriage, for sure. God and I don't fight all the time. But when our plans differ, that's what temptation is. It's when our plan and God's plan differs. And this is why temptation is a uniquely Christian thing. Non-Christians don't care so much about God's plans. They care about self-discipline, which is, you know, there's a lot of alignment between God's uh, ethics, spiritual, and moral code. But it's also very different than the Christian concept of temptation. James, the half-brother of Jesus gives us this definition in his book called James. He says, and remember when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes, temptation comes from our own desires, our own plans, which entice us and drag us away, presumably from, from God's plan. Because temptation is when our plan and God's plan differs. Now, the next verse, verse 15, in this passage is hard. This is a hard truth that a lot of us have discovered. It says, these desires, these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. That's a harsh word. It's a harsh picture. And some of you might not understand the context of it. In the world of antiquity, it was very common then. It's not as common now, and it's a painful thing. It sounds harsh. I wanna be careful how I say this, but what James is referring to is a stillborn birth. And he's talking about the disappointment that sin brings, you're, you're pregnant with excitement, but you give birth to disappointment and loss and sadness. I wonder how many of us have experienced giving birth to death through sin. You wanted to look at porn. You wanted to have an affair. You wanted to do this thing. You wanted to do this thing that was forbidden and you hoped and you fantasized and you thought it would be so amazing and so fun, but you do it and it just, it's just disappointment and sadness. That's sin. Maybe you wanted to tell somebody off for saying what they said. You know, maybe it was a wife, maybe it was a sister, it was somebody. And they said this and they just had a big mouth and you wanted to shut them down. So you fantasized about the moment and you thought I could say this and whatever. And, they did. and you move towards the opportunity and you pick a fight at Thanksgiving at just the right time. And she starts running her mouth off. And at just the right time, you deliver those words. You're just like your mother. And she is just, and you see, and oh, and it, and you thought it was gonna feel great. But when you cut her to the core, it doesn't feel good at all, does it? It's the same with lots of temptation, revenge, unforgiveness, anger, deceit, adultery. It all gives birth to death in the long run. The temptation cycle has five parts, five steps, really. First part is temptation. Temptation is when your plan and God's plan differ. Then there's the fantasy this is where you start fantasizing about what if I live out my part of the plan? What if I do this thing I really want to do? And then you move towards it. 
You start to actually, you know, plan to maybe we're just going to hang out alone and we're just going to do this and whatever. And you break the touch barrier, you do whatever. And then the act of the sin. It's what you always wanted. And instead of bringing life, it brings, it brings death. I wonder how many people are living in the temptation cycle in different areas of our life today. How many of us keep experiencing the death and loss that only sin can bring? God is a good and loving father. He loves us enough to call us away from things that will ultimately break our hearts and bring death. That's what sin ultimately does. But I know a lot of us who feel stuck in the sin cycle. The good news is that God throughout the Bible gives us a plan to overcome it. We're gonna look at one such passage where God outlines how to overcome temptation from Genesis chapter 39, verses six through 14. We're gonna exposit it verse by verse. And what it shows us is four key steps to overcoming temptation. This passage is about a Jewish patriarch. His name is Joseph. Some of you have heard of him. He's an amazing guy who faced temptation in a lot of different areas of his life. You see, he was such a winsome and captivating son. His fathers decided to make him the future of the family, the one who would inherit the most to run the family business. Out of jealousy, his brothers ultimately kidnapped him. They were going to murder him, but instead they, they sell him into slavery. What an ultimate betrayal. I mean, you really think about this and it's easy for me to say those words, but I want you to think about the context of those words. His brothers, 10 of his brothers, he had 11 brothers total, 12, well, 12, including him, but 10 of his brothers betrayed him on the worst level. Imagine your family selling you as a slave. Oh, it's bad. All in a plot to take his inheritance. How much temptation do you think he faced to hate them? I mean, God calls us to forgive, but come on, his plans and God's plans had to have differed. There's no doubt. I'm sure that he fantasized at night, you know, I'm going to escape this. I'm going to go home. I'm going to tell my dad, I'm back. And then guess what? You know, look what your sons did. And I'm the good guy. And he's going to get all the inheritance now. Now they get nothing and whatever. And he imagined, can you imagine the look on their faces? I mean, that's what Joseph would do. After he was sold as a slave, he ends up being super successful in his master Potiphar's house. And he gets promoted to be the head of basically everything in his master Potiphar's house. He's doing awesome. Bible says though that Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, just like my wife's husband. <laughs> and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come sleep with me, she demanded. This is a very clear moment where his fleshly plans and God's plans would come into conflict. It's more than likely that Potiphar had a trophy wife. He is, Potiphar is the head of the temple guard. It's basically, he's an NFL player, right? He probably had like an NFL smoke show of a wife, right? And Joseph was certainly tempted, there's no doubt. He wanted to listen to his fleshly plan ahead of God's plan. And the first thing that he did, the first step is revealed in Genesis 39, verse eight. It says, but Joseph refused. Look, look. And the key word here is look, he told her. My master trusted me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held nothing back from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. And here's what he's doing. This is critical and, and, and I don't want you to miss this. This first step is awesome. He is assessing the loss decade by decade. He's assessing the loss. He's looking down the road and he's realizing if I do this, I'll get 30 minutes of passion, a few seconds of pleasure and I'll lose my position in life. I'll lose my self-respect. I'll lose my relationship with my boss. I'll lose my reputation. And most importantly, this is a sin against God. He's assessing the loss decade by decade. And this is such an important skill. I mean, this is such an important skill to think about with anything, especially temptation, but anything. And this is a skill that my parents focused on with my brother and I. You know, we had a really open relationship, my mom and dad and, and myself. I would say anything to them and they were so good at not losing their minds, right? They would just stay calm. I would tell them, hey, I'm thinking about doing this terrible thing. And instead of being like, don't you dare do that, they would ask, what would happen if you do that? What's the story that you want to tell your kids and grandkids? They taught us to think longitudinally. The Hill Boys were taught by their parents to think about the loss that sin brings decade by decade. And this more than anything was so critical, not just in avoiding sin in the moment, but teaching children to follow God's plan. Some of you right now, and I want to practice this with you. Some of you right now might be tempted to deviate from God's plan in a part of your life because that's what temptation is, right? You might be thinking maybe I want a divorce in the moment because forgiveness is hard and you're dissatisfied and you're lonely, and you feel disconnected, and you've fallen out of love, and you just want to think about yourself sometimes because, you know, all they do is you think about them, you serve everybody, and you lost yourself or whatever it is. But let's visualize the loss decade by decade. Friendships, gone. Houses, wealth, gone. Community, gone. 
Graduations, I mean, difficult. You know, you show up and they're there and you're there and whatever and the new is there and the steps and the whatever. Weddings, oh, how many weddings do you know and you've got the blended and it's difficult and who's gonna walk down the aisle and who's gonna sit where and it should be a joyous day, but it's not because you have the stress and you feel bad and whatever. And holidays, oh my goodness, maybe you found freedom from him, but now holidays, you're putting stress on the kids because they've got whatever and they gotta go to here and there and whatever. Grandchildren, oh, that's difficult and who is and what is and who's grandma and who's and whatever. Then sickness, an old age, and who's gonna care for who? And financial ramifications, I mean, now it's, you know, you got steps and blended and you got a trust and a trustee and all this stuff because who's gonna get what and how's this gonna work? And you're gone and now everybody's fighting and instead of having a family, you know, siblings are pitted against one another, just like Joseph, who came from a blended family himself. It's amazing how zooming out for a moment changes our perspective, doesn't it? And what it does, and this is interesting, is it increases our understanding of God's plans. See, Joseph could have just thought about himself in the moment. He could have just thought, well, she is a smoke show and she is coming on to me and she is my boss's wife. So she's kind of my boss too. And she told me to do this. So it's not really my fault. But instead he thought about the loss decade by decade. This is the first thing you do when you're facing temptation is you think about the loss decade by decade. How many of us would have made different business decisions, different marriage choices, different friendship choices if we just first paused and thought about the loss decade? by decade. This is a game changer. And what it does, and this is big, what it does is it helps us see the wisdom behind God's plan. And what it, and this is so cool, is it will realign your heart with God's. Because temptation is when your plans and God's plans differ. But when you think about the loss decade by decade, you're going through this process many times where your heart is realigned with God's plans and the temptation goes away. A lot of times, all you have to do is go through step one in this process and you're good. But sometimes you don't. And the second thing, sometimes you gotta go farther. Joseph did, and this is so smart. It says, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her. And this is big. Okay, I want you to see these words. He kept out of her way as much as possible. See, and that's, that last line, this is so critical. What he did was he decided ahead of time what he was gonna do. Okay, when it said, kept out of her way as much as possible, what does that tell us? Well, what it tells us is that he thought ahead of time about how the temptation would come to bear on him and he made a decision, this is big, he arranged his life in such a fashion so as to minimize the problem. He made a choice before the heat of the moment to avoid the heat of the moment. And some of you guys, you look at a guy like Joseph and it's like, well, he's so godly. I could never do that. No, no, no. He is just as fleshly as any of us. But what he did is he had the wisdom to decide ahead of time who he was gonna be and arrange his life in such a fashion so that he could avoid the heat of the moment. He's a guy like everybody else. But he said, I am gonna decide ahead of time. Game it out in your mind. What can I do to avoid a situation where my plan and God's plan differ? And furthermore, if something does happen, I'm gonna decide ahead of time, this is what I'm gonna do. Right, if somebody comes to me at work and calls on me to compromise my faith and profane the name of God by affirming this crazy, ridiculous thing, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna freeze in front of my boss and be like, uh, no, I have already decided. I've already set things up. I've already made a decision. So when that moment comes, this is what I'm gonna do. Now, now here's the thing. I like to, because I'm a, I'm a forward thinker, I like to think of all the different permutations and situations I could face, and this is what I'm gonna do. But I know that I can't think of everything. So here's what I've decided is um, to recite the end of Joshua 24, verse 15 in my mind. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I mean, when I face, I've decided ahead of time, look, 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 as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord, right? And I face a decision, I just think, look, I'm gonna serve God here. There've been plenty of times in my life, like many of you, where an opportunity like the one Joseph is facing or something different has come along. And I've already decided, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, I'm gonna serve the Lord, that's it. When you have a temptation to sin, a temptation to cheat on taxes or cheat on a spouse or to not honor God with finances or to gossip and lie or to get revenge or to live in unforgiveness, whatever it might be, to fall into bitterness, to fall into a victim mentality, to live with joyless hopelessness. I want you to have already decided in your heart, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We're not gonna do that sport because I'm gonna raise my kids in God's house and that will come into conflict with it. We're not gonna fall down that road. We're not gonna go into that place. We're not gonna become keeping up with the Joneses. As for me and my house, we've already decided ahead of time, we're gonna serve God. Which brings me to the next step. This is critical and I don't want you to miss this. It says, one day, one day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. 
she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come sleep with me. Notice how it starts. It says one day. And this is what I want you to get. And I'm kind of nuts about um, dealing with the heat of the moment ahead of time. I like to build structures in my life that make sinning very difficult and avoid temptation. But we can make a plan. And we can think ahead of time and we can work to avoid the heat of the moment as much as possible. But in life, we are all in many different areas going to face our one day. And what Joseph did was he got ready for his one day so that when it came, he was already prepared. I think the foundation of the one day principle is laid down in the second step. We make plans, we avoid evil. We put um, accountability software on our phones, computers, whatever we do, we decide ahead of time. But no matter how well we prepare ahead of time, there will eventually be a one day. That's why we prepare ahead of time. My kids, just want to give you an example of this in my life. My kids have a book that I like to read to them called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. And this is a book I'm actually really passionate about. I recommend, I think you should start reading it. You know, when your kids are young, two, three, four years old, I've started reading it with my kids and it's a really great book. The average age of exposure to hardcore pornography for kids in America is 11. It's much younger for boys and that's the average. And I've talked to too many young men who have been traumatized by this, victimized by this really. And I just think, to what length would I go to to prevent a sexual predator from getting their hands on my kids? I have a 12 gauge shotgun. I mean, there's nothing I wouldn't do. I would, I would go all the way for sure. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. There are sexual predators all over the internet, on Instagram, on TikTok, just in general secular culture that are trying to destroy my kids' minds. And I'll tell you what, there is nothing I wouldn't do to stop that either. We have, and this is, this is, this is a lot, but we have taken every precaution with our kids. Our house is locked down. We don't have a TV. My kids don't have electronics. We don't really have Wi-Fi on our side of the house. My parents have it, but we can't really use a signal. My kids, the only thing they have is a digital ink Kindle and we control what books are on it. We don't have streaming. We don't have any of that stuff. We don't have computer games. Because look, I want my kids to have pure minds. I'm protecting them from predators. It's just what I'm gonna do. But I know, and this is hard, but I know that one day will come. And my favorite part of the Good Pictures, Bad Pictures book is the part where it says, what do you do when you see a bad picture? Okay, it says, close your eyes, turn away, run and tell an adult. And I practice it with my kids. Even when they're little, what do you do when you see a bad picture? Let's practice. Close your eyes, turn away, run and tell an adult. I wanna practice with them. I want them to be ready for it because I'm not just protecting, I'm preparing, I'm preparing. And that's what Joseph did, I believe, ahead of time. You see, so many of us, I mean, we look at this thing with Potiphar like, well, he's a better man than me. No, he's not a better man than you. He prepared ahead of time. And he did exactly, exactly what good pictures, bad pictures said. Perhaps he had read the book, but it says, Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. No matter what the temptation is, no matter what it is in your context, I want you to make a plan for your one day. I want you to visualize. And most of us, we see it coming. We know what it's gonna be. We can prepare, we can visualize. I mean, there aren't that many categories of what it could possibly be. I want you to prepare. This is who I'm gonna be when the moment comes. Now, I wish... I wish I could say that it worked out for Joseph, but it didn't. Potiphar's wife was very much like Amber Heard. If you don't know who she is, she falsely accused Johnny Depp of doing a bunch of things to her and destroyed his career and life. That's what Potiphar's wife did. Joseph's career, reputation, sullied and destroyed. He was discriminated against because he was a man and a slave and he was put into jail innocently for many years. Many more bad things happened to him. And you know, it's easy to look at Potiphar's wife and blame her, but really it all began with his brothers, didn't it? I mean, they're the ones that sold him as a slave and she did wrong, but really they did the ultimate wrong over inheritance money. Now it's interesting in the story, and some of you know the end, some of you don't, but um, years later, Joseph, through a series of events, would be put into a place where he could get back at his brothers. He, He ends up being the head of all of Egypt's food supplies, which is just, it's a crazy string of events. And his brothers, because of a famine in the land, his brothers end up coming to Egypt to get food and they don't even recognize that Joseph is the one who is deciding whether or not they're gonna get food. I mean, it's just crazy. You know how things come full circle. It's an irony. The world has been turned on its head. I mean, how could he possibly get there? Now, question, if you had an opportunity to get back at these vicious people who betrayed you in the worst way possible, what would you do? Right? They stole his life from him. He lost his life with his family. He spent years in prison, years as a slave. They deserved payback if anyone ever did. And the first time I heard the story as a kid, I mean, in my mind's eye, I heard the music playing. You know, I just thought, this is it. He's gonna get his revenge. Like that great book you ever read it, The Count of Monte Cristo. You know, he gets the revenge and he does it. He does all the stuff. Or maybe, remember that movie with Mel Gibson, The Patriot? 
you know, and the guy and the main bad guy and like he says, you know, I'm the better man and then he dodges the bayonet and turns around with the musket that he made bullets out of his kid's figure and he shoots the guy in the stomach and it's like, yeah, you killed him, yes! That's what I imagine happening in this moment. He's gonna get him. That was a very elaborate fantasy that I just made up. But anyway, it's just what my, do- my mind does. But that's not what Joseph did. I mean, he ends up completely forgiving his brothers. But here's the thing, and I know a lot of us, it's easy to look at Joseph and be, oh, he is. He is one of the Jewish patriarchs. He's just a great man. No, no. It's not that he just had this immense amount of self-control. I'm sure his plans and God's plan differed. I'm sure it wasn't just that he had a good heart. Here's what he did. He assessed the loss decade by decade. I'm sure he decided ahead of time to forgive them and he prepared for the one day. I mean, what he did was he thought, if I ever have a chance, if I ever see my brothers again, what am I gonna do? You know, I've already lost them and I want a relationship with my family. What's killing him gonna do? What's whatever I'm gonna, you know what? If I ever see him, I'm just, I'm gonna forgive him. And he was ready for his one day and he already decided he was going to forgive. So instead of getting revenge, when the moment came, it wasn't like he was lost like a deer in the headlights. He decided ahead of time to forgive them and said, but Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. I want you to understand the gravity of those words. Those are words uttered by somebody who prepared ahead of time to forgive. He, in fact, probably had already forgiven them in his heart. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. How did he overcome the temptation? I believe he assessed the loss decade by decade. He decided who he was going to be already. And when his one day came, he was ready for it. Now there's, there's one more point to this whole process. And this is the most important point. This is really why I wrote this whole sermon. This is the, 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 the end part is the most important part. It's the best point. I really want you to get this because this is, this is so, so important because what you don't understand is how many years, decades, Joseph had to spend in misery before this point. And what he had to do, and this is critical, is, is he had to trust God in his meantime. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand. The meantime is a terrible time. That's why they call it mean. It's a time that involves suffering and self-deprivation. And sometimes it's very short, but sometimes it's long. Sometimes it's a lifetime. Because what the meantime is, and it's critical, and I want you to get this, lean into this. The meantime is the time between you trusting God and you seeing God's goodness. It's that time where you're just waiting on the goodness of God. God's plan generally does lead to the highest level of life satisfaction. For Joseph, it did in the end, but it took decades of slavery and innocent imprisonment. For some people in the Bible and in life, they never see God's goodness on this side of eternity. I wanna be clear, God's plan is good. If you look at America today, church attendance is one of the great aggregate predictors of life satisfaction, beyond a shadow of a doubt, and human flourishing. But sometimes in this life, we suffer. Sometimes we live in the meantime, but I believe that Joseph had a no matter what faith and he trusted God in his meantime. He trusted God in his meantime. And here's what this comes down to. Some of you are in your meantime. You are trying to trust God, but you haven't seen the goodness yet. And the meantime is just the worst. You're like Joseph in jail. You're waiting, you're wondering, you're saying, God, I did the right thing, but it feels like all the wrong things are happening. It's not just resisting the temptation once, it's trusting God in the meantime daily. It is the decision now, the temptation now, not to let your heart grow hard because you're waiting and wondering, God, where are you? I wanna ask you this question. Are you willing to trust God in the midst of your meantime? You assess the loss decade by decade. You decide ahead of time what you're gonna do. You are ready for the one time and then you trust God. You trust God in the meantime. Online. Hebron, jail campus, DeMont Wheatfield. I know there are some of you right now who can't see God's goodness in a life of celibacy, in a life of monogamy, in forgiving what feels unforgivable, in trusting God financially, in trusting God with your health. It reminds me of a time that my wife and I had with my son. I've talked about this before, but he was about three at the time. Eldon was three. And uh, he was given two hard candy pieces Um, and that was a big deal. I know that two lifesavers might not seem like a big deal to you, but in our house, we don't do much sugar. And I know some of you are like, what are you, Amish? You don't do TV? You don't do sugar? It's like, yeah, look, okay, I do it my way. But anyway, my son 
earned these two lifesavers for something that he did. And he proceeded to immediately drop them in the toilet accidentally. And then in this order, go pee on them. So that's not good. Um, but that was no problem for him because then he just turned around and started fishing them out of the toilet with his hands, trying to get them out, you know, cause they were still good. And uh, this is when my wife stumbled upon him. And as a loving mother, she said, hey, I'm not gonna let you eat the pee pee candy. You can't eat it. Now this is a moment of temptation for my son because my wife's plans and his plans went in two different directions. Can you understand this? This is, here's, here's my wife's plan, which is, you know, um, not eating pee pee candy. Eldon's plan was, I'm gonna eat the candy. Now, my wife being a good pastor's wife, norm, normally we wouldn't let my kids throw temper tantrums like this. I don't let them disrespect their mother like this. This isn't, this isn't how it works in the Hill House. But for the sake of a sermon illustration, my wife just said, hey, I'm gonna record this on video so that you can show this in the church for time immemorial. And that's what we've done. Um, but uh, I want you to see just this video that's gonna set up the end of this message. Go ahead and play that video. Exactly. No, I want the blood. It has pee pee all over no, It fell in the toilet. No, and don't have any baby. You can't have it. And I want to have it. I know you want to have it, but you can't have it. I want to have it. I love you too much to let you have that pee pee. I know. I love you. He could not see our goodness in that moment. He was definitely in the meantime. He could not see that she cared for him and wanted what was best for him. He was so upset, in fact, that he temper tantrumed himself to sleep. Have you ever had a kid so mad they do that? Like, ah! 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 you know, just like, wow, that is, you are so mad. He was exhausted. In his mind, you know what he was wondering? Why would my loving mother and father deprive me of the candy that I earned? Why would they take that from me? Why would good parents allow me to face terrible things? I mean, they could just so easily and they don't understand what it feels like to want that. Now today, five years of being in the meantime, he's developed the ability to think critically and somewhat abstractly and he understands and he's grateful. But I wanna be clear, it took years in the meantime. I just think in a lot of ways, in a lot of moments, this is how a lot of people feel about God our Father. You know, you face a temptation where our plan and God's plan differs. And you're upset. Why would a good God allow me to be tempted? Why would a good God, when I'm faithful to Him, force me to deprive myself? Why would He even give me these feelings in the first place? It's ridiculous. How can He call Himself good? But I promise you, I promise you, in the same way my son, five years later, saw his parents' goodness. In the same way Joseph trusted God for decades in the meantime, would see God's goodness. You will see God's goodness. He's always faithful. He never fails. He always keeps his promises. He is a good father who loves you and he sees you and he's leading you to the very best in this life or the next. So I just wanna challenge you in the temptations of life, where your plans and God's plans differ. I wanna challenge you to trust God. I wanna challenge you to really assess the losses. I wanna challenge you to assess the loss and decide ahead of time. And as you face your one days, and as you choose God's plans ahead of your own, I want you to be faithful in the meantime, in the meantime, in the meantime. Look, I know how hard it is. I look especially at, at high schoolers, at teenagers, at, at students, at single 20 somethings. Listen, older folks, we gotta be praying for the younger generations. They are facing a level of temptation that is just without parallel in the modern era. And young people, I want you to know, waiting on the Lord is worth it. God keeps his promises. I want you to live out God's plan for your life. I wanna challenge you to trust him in the meantime. It's worth it. He keeps his promises. He's faithful. I wanna challenge young adults with young children, young moms and dads, in the brunt of raising babies and toddlers with tired hearts, messy homes. Trust God in the meantime, he's faithful. It's amazing to me how I could have resentment towards a toddler, but you know, once I had one, I understood. And I had to say, God, I trust you in the meantime. I trust you in the meantime, I forgive this child and I'll continue to point them to you. I look at families with 
teenagers and preteens. The temptation there is great as well, isn't it? To trust God in the midst of it all, to say, God, no matter what happens, the temptation for the traveling sports, for the vacations, we're in this fun age and we fought to get to this golden era, this little eye blink of time. Point your kids to Jesus, I dare you to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it might look like they're having more fun and it might like, look like these things, but your kids loving Jesus and you diligently pointing them to the Lord in all things at all times is worth it. You trust God in the meantime. And I look at 50 and 60 and 70 somethings empty nesters with empty homes and possibly empty hearts. You trust God in the meantime. You trust God in the meantime. You let him fill you. Don't look to the things of this world. God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises and he's faithful. You have what it takes to overcome temptation, not because of your power, but because of God inside of you. Right now at all of our locations, online, at the jail, Hebrew and Demont Wheatfield, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? I want you to meditate on your life right now. I believe that God ordained this message for some people in this moment, and you know who you are. And you know what it is. You know where your plan and God's plan is differing. Whether you've already walked into your plan or you're thinking about it, would you just turn to Jesus? Would you assess the loss and say, God, I trust your plan. I choose to be faithful to your plan. Right now, You don't need to say it out loud, but if that's you in your heart, would you just turn from your plans and trust God with his plan? I want you to imagine that area, that place, the work, the job, the relationship, whatever it is, unforgiveness, the bitterness, the shame, the whatever it is, you give it to the Lord God. I trust you with this in my life. And then I just want you to visualize the meantime. I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna be easy. I'm not gonna tell you it's gonna be quick. I'm not gonna tell you it's short, because it might not be. But whatever the meantime is, whether it's days or decades or a lifetime, I want you to say, God, I trust you with my meantime. You take it. I trust you with my meantime. You're good. You keep your promises. I'll be faithful, because you're faithful, because you first love me. Lord God, I pray for our churches at all locations. Would you give us the courage to trust you? We resolve to to see your plans and follow them. We decide ahead of time. We're ready for the one day. And we just choose in the meantime to trust you. Would you strengthen us by your spirit? Would you refresh us with your presence? We thank you for your grace and your gospel, which gives us hope and purpose in our lives. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said amen and amen.